When Christians learn the information presented thus far in this film, many are still hung up on the idea that the Jews are physically descended from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and that the rest of us are all Gentiles. But is it really that simple? The only way a person could really prove that they're a Jew would be with the genealogy. In fact, most of today's so-called Jews, they don't know what tribe they're from. Do people know amongst the Jewish community, hey, I'm of converts, or hey, I'm actually of the tribe of Judah, or the tribe of Benjamin, or the tribe? As far as the tribe is concerned, we don't know. I don't know what tribe I belong to. Mm. The only ones who do know, I mentioned the Kohen, the ones right. they know, because that's transferred from father to son, father to son. Okay. Because there are still certain things that the Kohen slash priest, certain blessings that he says, and so on and so forth. So they've kept their lineage, they know. Myself, I, I have no idea what tribe my ancestors okay. belong to. And, and you say probably most Jews don't know what tribe. Nobody, yeah, very, it's just uh, that wasn't preserved. It's not really important. Today it's not important at all, no. Okay. If it really made a difference who is descended from Israel and who is not, then why would God tell us to avoid genealogies? The Bible says in Titus 3.9 that we are to avoid genealogies. The New Testament is very clear. It doesn't matter where your physical ancestors came from. In Christ, there is neither Jew nor Gentile. The Bible says clearly there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. So why do we think today that there's a difference between the Jew and the Greek? And we think that somehow if someone is descended from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that they somehow are just automatically God's chosen people, whether or not they believe on Jesus Christ. And they may be circumcised in the flesh, but the Bible says it's the circumcision of the heart and the spirit that makes you a Jew in God's eyes. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, it says in verse 4, neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies. I want you to keep that phrase in your mind. Endless genealogies, which minister questions rather than godly edifying, which is in faith, so do. Now in Titus, he just said avoid genealogies. But here he says to avoid endless genealogies. Now I'm going to show you why genealogies are endless. They truly are endless. This is what a family tree looks like. Now, at the bottom of this family tree, we just have one person, which is you. Now, you descend from two people, don't you? Your mother and your father. So if we go back one generation, you come from two people as a direct descendant, right? But if we go back another generation, you don't just have two grandparents, you have four grandparents. And it keeps doubling, doesn't it? Because you have two parents, four grandparents, eight great-grandparents, 16 great-great-grandparents, and you have 32 great-great-great-grandparents. That means if I were gonna do a family tree that went back five generations, I would have to have a piece of paper wide enough to where at the top of that paper, I'd be able to have 32 people's names, wouldn't I? Because that's how many ancestors I'm gonna have directly in that fifth generation. Now, if I went to the sixth generation, my paper is gonna have to be twice as wide because now I'm gonna have 64 slots to put in names, right? Well, what happens though, is that as we go back further, this number gets really big. Now, in order to understand how this chart works, we have to understand how long a generation is. How long is the average generation then? Well, they say 20 to 25 years. Okay. Now, a generation has nothing to do with lifespan. For example, my mother was 30 years old when she gave birth to me, and women generally give birth between the ages of 20 and 40. So let's just take 30 as an average. 30 is a nice round number, and 30 is a very conservative number for this calculation. So a generation is 30 years meaning somebody has a child when they're 30, and then they have a child when they're 30, they have a child when they're 30. Nothing to do with lifespan. So that means that if we go back 10 generations, then that's 300 years, right? So let's just round off and say that if we went back in our family tree about 10 generations, we're gonna be at about the year 1700. Now, because our family tree is getting wider, if we wanted to do a complete family tree showing all of our ancestors back to the 10th generation, we would have to have a piece of paper that was wide enough to have 1,024 slots. Because 10 generations ago, there would be 1,024 a, a, people that we would directly descend from. Now, here's what I noticed when I did my family tree, though. 
When I went back 10 generations, you know what I started noticing? These are no longer unique people because there had been some intermarriage in that 300 years that had unknowingly taken place. Let's go back 20 generations. So now we're back around the year 1400. Well, if I wanted to have a complete family tree, I would have to have a piece of paper that could fit 1,048,576 names. That's a pretty big piece of paper. So in the year 1400, if I'm gonna trace all of my ancestors, I mean, I'm gonna tell you who all of my ancestors from the 1400s are, I would have to show you a family tree that just at the top would have a million some people, just in the top row, let alone everything else coming downward, right? If I were to go back 30 generations, now I'm only in the year 1100. I'm not even close to the time of Christ yet, am I? No, if I went back to the year 1100, 30 generations, I would have 1,073,741,824 ancestors in that generation. Now, listen, they're not all unique. I, when I did my genealogy, I found this relative that she was my 10th great-grandmother on this side and my 11th great-grandmother over here because people marry their fifth and sixth cousin without knowing it, mm. obviously. You know what I mean? So there's a lot of repeating going on, right? You know what that shows? That a lot of people are descending from the same people. Cannot help but intermarry. It's impossible not to because of these numbers. Now, but look, the real number that we want to go back to is not 1100 AD. Let's go back to 70 AD because 70 AD is when all the Jews were scattered. Now, when you say scattered all over the world, do you mean that in the most literal sense? I mean, all nations? Yes, in the most literal sense. If we were to go back to 70 AD and we were to have a family tree that shows all of our ancestors in 70 AD and how they're connected, that top line would have 18 quintillion, 446 quadrillion, 744 trillion names from 70 AD. Now, who thinks that there were 18 quintillion, 446 quadrillion, 744 trillion people living at the time of Christ or shortly thereafter? No. In fact, the approximate population at that time was 200 million. Of that 200 million, let's just call seven or eight million Jews. You say, I don't like that number. Well, that number's not going to matter in a minute. Okay. So let's just call it seven, seven, eight million. Okay. So if there are 200 million people on the earth at the time of the temple being destroyed, and about seven or eight million of them are Jews, that means if I have an ancestor from that era, there's a one in 27 chance that they were of Israel. So think about this. What if I were buying a lottery ticket and the odds of that lottery ticket coming up a winner are one in 27? Because that's the winning ticket that says, you're Jewish. You're of the chosen people. You are of Israel. You are an Israelite indeed. I've got a one in 27 chance. You say, well, Pastor Anderson, if you have a one in 27 chance, you're probably not gonna win that lottery because you got 26 chances of losing. Okay, but what if I buy 18 quintillion lottery tickets? You got it. You think I'm gonna win? Let me ask this. How many times do I have to hit it to be descended from Abraham? How many times do I have to hit it to be descended from Israel? You say, well, you know, I'm black. I'm of Africa. You know, how can I be connected with Abraham? Well, stop and think about it. Think about Israel's children. You know what? One of Israel's children, Joseph, guess where his wife was from? Egypt. Joseph's wife was of Egypt. Where's Egypt? Africa. Moses' wife was Ethiopian. His second wife was Ethiopian. So we already see, even in Bible days, intermingling with Africa, intermingling with the sons of Ham. I mean, if you think about it, the tribes of Ephraim and Manasseh were half of Ham and half of, of Israel because Israel's son, Joseph, married an Egyptian woman who's of Ham. So all of the Ephraimites and Manassites are descended of Ham. And not only that, but all throughout history, you've had all kinds of merchants and missionaries and conquerors. Even, you know, you think of the Mongolian Empire. 
that went all over the world and that conquered China, that conquered Japan, that conquered Korea. All the ships that sailed and went here and there and everywhere. You only have to have one ancestor. Out of your millions and millions of ancestors, you only have to have one that descends from Israel. And you are a direct descendant of Israel today. You sit there and say, oh, I'm just purely a white person. Oh, I'm just purely Asian. I'm just purely African. No, you're not. No one is. People have been marrying and intermarrying for thousands of years. So you can't have any pure uh, population. You know what? The Bible was right when it said we're all of one blood. Even populations that we think that has got to be 100%, they're not 100%. And that there was is rare. no 100%. So you can sit there and have your endless genealogy, it won't even be accurate. Because you know what you can't tell from a genealogy? Somebody who committed adultery and lied to their husband and said, oh yeah, this is your son. And he's not. You know, people do their genealogy mm -hmm. and they kind of just take everything as gospel. When in reality, there could be, as you euphemistically call them, non-paternity events. There's a non-paternity index, uh, mm -hmm. which uh, has been estimated at 0.05 percent uh, per generation. So mm -hmm. if you go back 20 generations, you're likely to have a non-paternity event. That's the soft way of saying it. And if you consider that a generation is 20 to 25 years, that means in 500 years, you're due <laughs> in that line to, uh, to have a non-paternity event. Every 500 years. Yeah. In, in, in one line. So you know, on the, one line, in one line, how many lines, how many you, lines you have, right. right? So really, if somebody traces their genealogy, they couldn't really say, hey, I know for a fact, I know the whole story because I'm looking at this genealogy because the DNA test is going to reveal more. Well, DNA doesn't lie and uh, people lie. DNA right. doesn't lie. Right. <laughs> so people could say, hey, I'm, I'm Jewish, I, I'm not exactly. Jewish, but the DNA. Right. The DNA doesn't have an agenda. People right. have an agenda. People right. have reasons to lie. Uh -huh. And also they might just not know the truth, you know, which yeah, is, sure. is possible so as well. So it's not even that they're lying, it's just no, that they're mistaken. They're just passing on mistaken information. One out of 15 Americans is adopted or has a parent that was adopted. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, that's a pretty high number Substantial, too, yeah. isn't it? I mean, who can tell you all the people in your, in your lineage that were adopted? Oh yeah, my ancestors 300 years ago were adopted. You're not gonna remember that. So there are adoptions, there's infidelity, there's traveling, there's conquest, there's merchants, there are missionaries. Different people have different things they wanted to hide. Right. And so they only tell you what they want you to hear. It doesn't matter where you're from, folks. God, you know why God said to avoid this? Because it hurts your mind to even think about this number. <laughs> you know? I mean, it, it, I mean, these numbers bend the mind. He's just like, just avoid it. <laughs> you know, just avoid endless. You know, you know what they minister? Questions. I mean, does does this make you feel really sure about your nationality now? No, it, it raises a lot of questions. So, what do you think about somebody going down to the DNA lab, getting their DNA tested? <laughs> And, and it comes back and says, oh, you know, you have these Jewish ancestors. I mean... I have no quarrel with them. Would you accept that if it... If Absolutely. It's, oh, okay. Because it's so I possible, because they're so scattered, right? Yeah, I would never argue with it. Mm -hmm. The director of this film, Paul Wittenberger, and I are just a couple of white guys. We've never been told that we're Jewish or have any Jewish ancestors. But we're going to go down and get our DNA tested and just find out if we do. We match your DNA profile against uh, over 400 population groups worldwide, mm -hmm. and we present you with a top 50. And for ancestral DNA, uh, we don't have to get thumbprints. Uh, I mean, it's not a legal document. Right. So that's all we need is the swab and the name. So these will go out tonight. Mm -hmm. uh, we should get results back in about three to four weeks.
A few weeks later, Paul and I got our results back, and just like they said, we were a mixture of a whole bunch of different nationalities. We had everything from Arab to Brazilian, Native American, and there were a lot of things on there that were a big surprise. And sure enough, when we looked at our deep ancestry, which goes back further than the top 50, we both had markers for Jewish DNA. So I figured I'd get my grandma's DNA tested to see if Jewish made it into her top 50. We tested my grandma, she's 94 years old. Uh-huh. And we wanted to swab her, you know, while she's still with us. Oh yes, that, I, that's very important. Yeah, so yeah. We, we got it. All right, grandma's results are right, in, let's check exciting. them out. All right, let's see her top 50, first of all. Number one, Ashkenazi Jew, number one. No way. So that explains why it was in my deep ancestry because it's her number one of her 50 nationalities. And her number one result was Hungarian Ashkenazi Jew. So, so her number one result was Ashkenazi Jewish. Wow. Well, with DNA consultants, I mean, you know, we've done this for many, many years. I haven't seen that very often to let you know. Mm -hmm. And every report, like I'm saying, is unique. People are like, oh, it's probably very general. No, everybody's very unique. I don't know when I've seen number one uh, Ashkenazi, so that is really no cool. Yeah. I mean, maybe three or five times. So let times. me ask you this: that is very rare. So if Grandma's DNA had number one Ashkenazi, is there any doubt that she's an Ashkenazi Jew? No. And if she's my grandmother, when the, what does that make me? If you're Jewish. So I'm Jewish. You don't have to accept <laughs> the religion. Right, but I mean, ethnically you could, speaking. Ethnically, you are. You know, okay. whether you, well, how, so whatever you, you want to do with it. Me, so you. So I've hold now on. pronounced you Jewish. <laughs> <laughs> Is that really what it all boils down to? <laughs> I mean, good night. That's DNA. Are you kidding me? What, what about Jesus? What about faith in Christ? How in the world can God's people be determined by DNA? Look, it doesn't matter what our genealogy says. It doesn't matter what our DNA results are. None of that is even important. The only thing that really matters is that we are a child of God through faith in Jesus Christ. And I found so much proof that Israel there is not the Israel that God's talking about. But we who have believed in God, who have the faith of Abraham, we are the children of God. We are the seed of Abraham. It says in Romans 9 verse 7, Neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children, but in Isaac shall thy seed be called. That is, they which are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God. But the children of the promise are counted for the seed. So the Bible says that the children of the flesh, the physical children of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, these are, it specifically spells out and says they are not the children of God. In fact, in Galatians 3, it explains that we're the children of Abraham. It says, know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. It's amazing to me though, how Christians overlook Galatians 3. Now, I'm, I'm almost 70 years old, I'm an old man. But I've never, ever, ever heard a sermon on Galatians 3, verse 29. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus, and if ye be Christ's, then are ye Abraham's seed, and heirs according to the promise. Both of those are fantastic. Who is the heir to the promise? Whoever has Jesus. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 11 reads, Wherefore remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world, but now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. Verse 19, now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. According to this scripture, we are fellow citizens of Israel. Because back in verse number 12, he said, when you were without Christ, you were aliens of Israel. You were strangers and foreigners to Israel. But in verse 19, he says, now you are fellow citizens with the saints. So who is the true Israel? Is it some guy over in the Middle East 
who doesn't even believe in Jesus and is worshiping Shekinah? Or is it the true believer of the Lord Jesus Christ who's been grafted in and brought nigh unto Israel? It's very simple. Jesus said in Matthew 21, verse 43, Therefore I say unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. Wow. They didn't bear fruits. They refused Jesus. They refused redemption. They refused to recognize the deliverer of Zion, the very Christ Jesus. And Jesus said, because of that, the kingdom is taken from you and given to another nation. Well, what is that nation? Is it Syria? Is it America? Is it England? Is it Germany? No, no, no. A spiritual nation. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, an holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. The Bible's not a book about God blessing one nation. That's why God told Abraham, in thee shall all nations of the earth be blessed. And that blessing is through Abraham's seed, the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, the Bible says in, in Hebrews chapter 11, that Abraham wasn't looking for a physical land. He looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. We as Christians are looking for a new Jerusalem. We're looking for a heavenly city. As Hebrews 11, the faith chapter points out, but now they desire a better country that is an heavenly. Wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. God has prepared a city for us, a city that we can't find physically on this earth because it's a heavenly city. It's something that God has prepared for those that have faith in him. When we're looking for Zion and when we're looking for Jerusalem, we're not looking for the one which now is. We're not looking for the one that we can touch. We're not looking for the one that's spiritually is Sodom and spiritually Egypt. We're, we're looking for the one that is heavenly, the one that is to come. The Bible says in Hebrews 12, 22, but ye are come unto Mount Zion and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels. So according to the New Testament, Zion is the heavenly Jerusalem not the physical Jerusalem that now is, but the heavenly Jerusalem will descend down from heaven. That is our capital city. That is our Zion. And so I'm Israel. Those people over there are not Israel. That's why Paul said they're not all Israel, that are of Israel, maybe of Israel, genealogically speaking, but you're not Israel as God counts as what his original intent was, a people that are of praise and of glory to him. We as Christians are the chosen people of God. We are the true Israel and we are marching to Zion.